Hello, my name is Martin Puker and in this video I would like to show you how the hippocampal formation looks like because I think it's pretty difficult to understand how it looks like when you just have anatomical slices of the mouse or the red brain. So here we have the mouse hippocampus. Uh, those volumetric data I obtained from the Allen Brain Atlas. And uh, just for your orientation, in the whole brain we would speak about the dorsal part and the ventral part, anterior, posterior, and lateral medial and here we see one side of the hippocampus or one hippocampus in one hemisphere basically and um, there we have those local axes which are called uh, the septal part and the temporal part and each of these layers can be divided into the proximal part and the distal part this for example here is ca3 and this is ca1 and here again we would have the proximal part and the distal part. But now gets, let's go through, through all the different areas. So let's start with the dental gyrus, which connects via the mossy fibers to CA3. After that we have CA2, which is I think in this volumetric data quite incomplete. Um, I think CA2 also goes into the temporal area. And then we have CA1 and CA3 connects with the um, shuffle collateralist to CA1. And after that we have the subiculum and you probably know that proximal parts of the CA1 area connect to more distant parts of the subiculum and vice versa. And this hippocampal loop receives input from the lateral and the medial interrhinal cortex. And the medial interrhinal cortex encodes or communicates more spatially related information and the lateral interrhinal cortex, yeah, more non-spatial information, let's put it that way. All right, um, now let's switch to the red hippocampus and here you see just the neural layers and now we can um, see how the, the interrhinal cortex, for example, connects to the dental gyrus. So the basic idea is that the topology of these layers is preserved in its mapping to CA1 and, well, maybe even to CA3 and dental gyrus, I'm not sure about that. But um, at least we can say that more dorsal parts of CA th uh, of the interrhinal cortex connect to more septal parts of the hippocampus and more uh, ventral parts connect to more temporal parts. Yeah. Then uh, dental gyrus neurons connect to CA3, which we see about here. And um, CA3 neurons have recurrent connections um, in the CA3 layers and connect via the Schaeffer collaterals um, to CA1. And those those exons, they, they go first of all um, yeah, in, in the superficial area and then go through this layer below CA1 and uh, then form synapses here with CA1 neurons. And well, CA1 neurons, as I said, connect to the subiculum in this very specific manner where distal parts of CA1 neurons connect to proximal neurons on the subiculum and vice versa. And those neurons in turn connect back to the enterrhinal cortex and thereby also maintain the topological relations. So superficial layers of the enterrhinal cortex connect to CA1 neurons. As I said, the topology is preserved and in the back projections, those neurons project basically back to the same location in the deep layer of the enterrhinal cortex. Um, don't take those um, spatial projections for granted, they are probably wrong, but I, I think they give you at least an idea of, of how it roughly looks like. I need actually more anatomical data about that to, to make the form of the axons uh, really correct. But the, the overall structure should be okay, I think. Okay, I hope this helps to understand how the Bacampo formation looks like. And if you would like to have a model of the hippocampus on your desk, you can go to Shapeways and order a 3D printed version of the red hippocampus in which one centimeter roughly corresponds to one millimeter in the original hippocampus.